So uh, let me welcome uh, our panel, Karina Tota and Stephen Newmark. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, normally when people hire ghostwriters, you don't actually get to see the ghostwriters on book tours. So today we're changing that. And, and uh, Karina and Stephen are two of the most forward-thinking ghostwriters, so to speak, for Mayor de Blasio in New York City. Uh, when the mayor took office about two years ago, the public housing was facing roughly $17 billion of unmet capital needs deferred from previous administrations. And just to give you a perspective, there's 700,000 people in public housing. That's like the size of San Francisco. So he turned to Karina and said, write a plan to fix this and make sure you give a voice to the residents. This is Karina. Uh, Stephen, uh, the mayor, published his plan about two weeks ago. And here the challenge is health care. So with Obamacare, we get much expanded access to health care. Mayor de Blasio said, Stephen, make sure every single New Yorker has health care, even if they're undocumented immigrants. And Stephen wrote the plan that's just been published. So uh, it's sometimes ghostwriters run into writer's block. And that's where civic consulting comes in. So what we do is we bring professionals on loan from the private sector, whether it's consulting firms, tech companies, architects, communications, and help people like Karina and Steven tackling big issues in cities solve those problems. And to do it in a coordinated way over time to see meaningful results for hundreds of thousands or millions of people. So as I recall, Karina, when we started working together, it was pretty early in your planning process. Is that right? That's absolutely correct. We, um, we started with a process that we call Next Generation NYCHA. And that is a strategic investment plan for the authority for 10 years to fundamentally change the way we operate, we're funded, and we engage with our residents. Now, uh, when we started working with, with um, Alexander and his colleagues, we were really still at the ideation and prioritization stage of strategic planning. Um, and we brought them a big, ambitious idea and said, we want to work with you over the next year or two to bring structure to this idea and to help us figure out how to work it. So um, just let me give you a little bit of background on the housing authority so that the concept um, resonates with you a little bit more. So as Alexander said, you know, we serve almost 700,000 people through public housing and through our Section 8 voucher program. Um, 2,600 buildings, 328 developments, uh, but from a resident perspective, if I was an average NYCHA resident, I would live in NYCHA housing for about 24 uh, years. It's possible, though, that my mother um, passed on the apartment to me and that I will pass it on to my children. Um, I may very likely be a senior. Um, about 40% of our heads of household are seniors, so we're kind of one big naturally occurring retirement community. Um, I may very well have neighbors that are employed because contrary to stereotypes about public housing, 61% of NYCHA's residents report, um, employment, report income from employment. Um, and it's likely that those employers are the New York City Department of Education, the New York City Police Department, and the New York City Housing Authority. So it's really public entities that employ NYCHA residents. But like I might be old, so are my buildings and my buildings are crumbling. 60% of NYCHA's buildings are 50 years of age or older, and so we face a tremendous, tremendous capital deficit, but at the same time, we have a tremendous amount of spaces on our ground floors that are not apartments um, that we have tremendous potential with. How can these spaces activate the community? How can they bring in a mix of uses to a community? If you think of public housing in New York City, hopefully you can conjure the image, a beautiful image of brown brick buildings separated from the street by grass. We call those grass moats. Um, so how can we, through the active activation, through the usage, through the planning um, of non-residential ground floor spaces, reconnect those uh, developments back into their surrounding community and better provide services for residents? So that's where we brought Alexander in. And so as you were tackling this question of you have all, you have hundreds of sites, every site has a ground floor, not surprising, right? What is it about that problem 
that was something different that you felt like you needed some external resources to tackle? One of the key tenets of Next Generation NYCHA is that if we're going to figure out how to become um, a better operating authority and address our $17 billion capital deficit, we need to focus on our core business, and that's being a residential landlord. For 81 years, NYCHA has been both a landlord and a social service provider. We don't have the funding to be a social service provider anymore, nor do we have the quality of services to be that provider. And our expertise is in residential landlord, not in retail, not in community space. But it doesn't mean that that opportunity should be lost. And so we had to reach out to find the experts with Alexander, the lawyers, the zoning consultants, the retail brokers, the architects to help us look at this space because we can't afford the resources, both actually and optically, to do this work. And, and Stephen, uh, bringing you in the conversation. So as uh, Mayor de Blasio's healthcare advisor. You and I have been working together pretty closely on public hospital issues, but you faced uh, an impending deadline when you reached out. Do you want to talk a little bit about what that challenge was? Sure, sure. Let me give a little bit of background on the project that I was engaged in, and then I'll talk about how Alexander came to be a part of that project. So the project that I was engaged in was a challenge from the mayor to essentially provide health care services for those who were um, ineligible for health care, uh, ineligible for insurance, both public as well as subsidies under the Affordable Care Act. And that essentially is the, our undocumented immigrants. In New York City, we have 500,000 undocumented immigrants, and the mayor saw this as both a philosophical and a fiscal uh, responsibility to, to provide health care, greater health care access for these individuals. The philosophical argument, of course, was that these are our residents and it's our responsibility to take care of them in the same manner we take care of all of the other 8.4 million residents of New York City or 7.9 million residents, excluding the undocumented. So that's the philosophical argument. The fiscal argument is that New York City operates the largest municipal hospital system in the country. We have 11 acute care facilities, which is by far and away the most of any other large uh, other large municipality, these individuals are essentially getting health services anyway, for the most part. They're coming into our hospitals, they're uh, using and in some cases overusing the emergency departments because they're not accessing primary preventive care and not using the system in an efficient manner. So the mayor's charge to me was, we need to find a way to get these people into the system sooner, earlier. So we put together a task force on immigrant health care access. The task force itself was a little more global in scope, looking at immigrants as a whole. We knew the challenge of just going after the undocumented would be a little too, um, was going to be very challenging, and we needed to get some of the, uh, if you will, some of the low-hanging fruit, some of the barriers that all immigrants address in order to uh, almost, if you will, provide political cover, start, start to get some victories in with the immigrant community uh, in terms of health care access, while still attacking the longer term problem, the more onerous issue of dealing with the undocumented. And so Stephen, just so hopping I'm, in here, and you're talking about optics. You're actually talking about a program that radically is going to inject millions or tens of millions of new funding into health care. Right. Yet at the same time, you're reaching out for pro bono resources. W what's the dynamic here? Okay, so. We got to the point, so we, we, we brought in what we thought, we brought in the top experts in working within the city, from the city's public health department, from the city's public hospital system. We have a mayor's office of immigrant affairs. We have uh, what we call the Center for Economic Opportunity, which are, uh, for lack of a better term, the numbers crunchers for the city. We had our best uh, folks working on it, trying to figure out. We had a ton of data sources. We had data from our public hospitals, from the public health system. From, us, from, our, from our public health uh, department, from our local community clinics. We had the data to, uh, from the state Medicaid office. We understood the cost, generally speaking, but we needed, what we needed, we got to a point where we really needed to drill down on a cost per cost basis. How much, was, how much would it actually cost the city to start funding and paying for uh, health services for these individuals? Uh, we had a broad estimate, which we presented to the mayor at, at, some, at one point. Uh, it was a very high number, and the mayor looked at us and said, okay, I need you to get the real number, and I need it immediately. There were two issues with that. The first is we, we, we were sort of at our wit's end in terms of who we could lean on within city government. We needed to look outside of city government to bring in greater experts. Part of the problem with going outside of city government is when you need to issue uh, a, a, an RFP, when you need to pr uh, procurement, the the laws, the rules in New York and other municipalities as well, it's, it's, an, it's, it's a process. Uh, from start to finish, it's a minimum 
four months. We were told uh, if everything fired on all cylinders, it would take four months to get a, a team on board. So you had four months just to do the procurement, and what was your deadline? But the, ma really but the mayor gave us a deadline of four weeks. Okay. So the only way to get around that was to look to pro bono services. And I will, I actually have never told this to Alexander because I'm indebted to him to begin with, and I'm just going to be in greater debt to you when, you when you learn this. I pretty much threw up a Hail Mary. I knew Alexander, and I called him. I remember the day I called him. I was at a conference kind of like this. I went in the back room, called Alexander, explained our situation. And I would say within an hour, you had lined up uh, a firm, AT Carney, that was able to come in, provide services, in including uh, they provided an associate who was essentially seconded to help us work on uh, the financial numbers for three weeks straight and got us to the numbers that we needed in order to present it to the mayor, a proper, a proper accounting of what we were looking for. Yeah. And, and, I would, and I would just, you know, just to be clear, that could not have been done without pro bono services. So a lot of people think pro bono and they say that means you don't have money. And what we're hearing here are these multi-billion dollar efforts where there are structural barriers to procuring or staffing in a traditional way, which is the reason to go pro bono. And in fact, in some ways, pro bono can be costlier. Like here these guys are flying across the country to talk about it. Right? <laughs> so the time commitment to make it work is huge. Uh, could, faced with the, this ground floor challenge and billions of dollars of funding and opportunity. Why, why is it about the pro bono that was different from the resources you had on your team at NYCHA or that you were securing through more typical procur uh, procurement channels? Absolutely. Um, so I think there are sort of two main differences. One is internally how were we organized to try to get to this goal. So if the goal is activate your ground floor spaces and also diversify revenue base by getting some more rent from those spaces and or by better serving residents, um, that means we need to manage those spaces sort of intentionally, strategically, and professionally. The re reality is when I first went to Alexander, I said, so we have a lot of space. Uh, so far, I think we have three to four million square feet, but we're not totally sure. Uh, and that is because um, several million square feet is managed by the community programming unit. So they aren't real estate professionals, they were community service programmers. And so we had to start shifting away organizationally from how we were gonna manage that space um, in order to match our goal. So first there was eventually what we got to doing with Alexander is moving that department out of community programs and under our leasing function. Then there's our leasing function, which leases 1.5 million square feet of corporate space and 250,000 square feet of retail space, and taking that function and consolidating it not under administration where it lived, but under real estate and asset management, and coordinating it with our real estate development department as well. So these are sort of easy things to say and realize in hindsight, but actually getting an organization to buy into this, to understand why you're doing it, and then to make those changes has been a big part of this. And so essentially what you're saying is that the, the bureaucracy that had grown up over time said that if this space has a commercial potential, one person owns it at NYCHA. And if this space should be used for a community training program, a different person owns it. And if it's the mechanicals, a different person owns it. But if it's vacant, then what? who owns that one? No one, really. So, <laughs> I mean, or, you know, it's, it's in the corner of somebody's mind or spreadsheet. Um, and so you were able to, to restructure this, the, the management of this in order to uh, approach the real estate issue in a unified way. But it, you must have faced a, a lot of barriers through this. What were some of the challenges to restructuring and to making an organization that reflects the needs of our tenants better? So the number, one, um, the number one challenge that we face is trust. Trust and the fear that goes along with it. So um, as Stephen mentioned, um, when Mayor de Blasio came into office, he gave some very clear directives. And the directive that he gave to the New York City Public Housing Authority was reset your relationship with your residents. 
um, the amount of trust issues that were faced by me many of NYCHA stakeholders was the result of years of being ignored, um, promises that weren't kept. And so what we have tried to do little by little, because as you know, problems of trust that come to be over decades of neglect cannot be solved so quickly. Uh, but it was to start to regain that trust by how we did our work as, as much as what the outcomes of our work so Could you were. give an example of like, what was yes. the, what, what did you hear from, from residents? What is the, what actually happened in this? When so we did, we I actually led a pilot um, so that we could try a new resident engagement model, which was to lead community visioning sessions in three of our developments where we worked with our organizers who were usually, usually actually organized against us, uh, the community organizers who had traditionally done that. We partnered with them. So you're saying that the tenants you serve were the ones that were organizing against your plan to serve them better? Traditionally, yes. And so with this new reset button, we worked with those organizers to try to bring people out, to bring out traditional resident leaders, emerging resident leaders, residents who usually don't get involved, to say, what are your community's priorities? And taking them through workshops around setting priorities, um, voting on those priorities, determining what they wanted to start with, you know, what were the nuances around things. And so, for example, in those, we did in three developments, one in downtown Brooklyn, and one of their key, uh, um, key priorities was neighborhood retail. As the neighborhood around them had gentrified, they didn't have the services they needed. And if they were there, they couldn't access them. And so that was a key sort of impetus for this strategy getting put together. Um, and also just fear. Um, so just the need to inform, to talk to people, to engage them early, to, to figure out how resident jobs can be created through this initiative and resident employment and uh, training. So. And often in, in government, you see the barriers to change are it's unionized you know it's, it's bureaucratic uh, it's slow moving you know, sometimes we talk about the weebies so these are the people who say we be here before you we be here after you and uh, administrations come and go but the weebies are here forever so can you talk a little bit Stephen in your effort you actually tried to flip that notion on its head and go to the to the weebies and say how can you be uh, a voice of change and progress. So how is it that you engage people to, to drive that change? And what's the role of partnerships and external resources there? Sure, um, it, it, it is very, it, it's, it's, an, it's a unique position you hold when you're sitting in the mayor's office, the governor's office, uh, the president's office, essentially the executive office. You know your time is limited, you know that you're there for, uh, you, you're essentially a temporary employee. Whereas the agencies that you're dealing with, for the most part, a lot of the folks have been there structurally for a long time. They are entrenched in their ways, if you will, but they also have the expertise to get you where you need to go. And it can be, uh, there's, two, there's two sides to that coin. Um, what we were trying to do with the Immigrant Health Access Initiative, there's one specific hospital that we're trying to implement the program in, and uh, we went over to the hospital expecting to, to either uh, at some point, we were expecting to be, uh, be received with love and kindness. This is the greatest thing since the spread. Thank you for doing this. We're, you know, you're going to provide an opportunity for our patients to come in and get primary preventive care. I, we can't wait to deal with this. The initial reaction was, well, wait a minute. You're, you're essentially asking us to take on more uninsured. Uh, uninsured I think I know the patients. hospital you're referring to. This hospital, they speak, I think, 183 languages. Yes. Uh, they also have an emergency room that is so over capacity and is the emergency room for Rikers Island, the jail. So when you go into this emergency room, bays that were made for one bed are fitting four, plus if it's a prisoner, all the cops guarding that prisoner. So, so this is a place that is so overwhelming with community demand. And here Stephen is bringing potentially resources this answer is like, uh. So but, but, but on the flip side of that, there were things that we went in there expecting to be a little more troubling or a little more challenging. And for example, we're, we're looking to sign folks up for this program, enroll in, in, into this program. Our plan is to have a three-month enrollment period as well as a ramp-up period to, to promote uh, the, uh, the project itself. As soon as we walked into this hospital, we, we sat around the table. We mentioned we're going to do this enrollment period. We're looking for X amount of patients. We're looking three months, maybe a month leading up to it. We're going to go into the community do all these mailings, do whatever. The reaction from, from the staff at the hospital was, we can get you as, twice the number of patients you need within four days. Whatever patients you need in this particular uh, rubric of undocumented, uninsured, we have those patients, we have them in spades, 
we'll get them for you. Give us four days. That's all you need. So it, 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 there's a flip side to it. You need institutional knowledge, but sometimes it's like, it's like pushing an elephant. It, you know, they have their entrenchment of what they're doing. Um, and you know, you're trying to bring them along to the mayor's vision. So I mean, often, often people talk about working at City Hall as working in a fishbowl. All the eyes are on you. In New York, we have, what, like five papers that report every time you sneeze, right? And uh, which, which uh, so it's this incredible sense of transparency and public pressure around every moment, uh, which can often be a barrier to change, right? Because you don't want to admit there's a problem until you not only know the answer, but you've implemented it. And then you can have a nice press conference about it. But it seems like you are using pro bono resources as a way of changing that dynamic. So you want to talk a little bit about how optics can be both a barrier to change and how these partnerships are ways that, that you overcome that barrier? Absolutely. Um, so as, as Alexander mentioned, five, five newspapers looking at our every move. Um, and we get the title of uh, the tabloid's favorite slumlord. Uh, so there are no shortage of stories uh, to write on us. And, and unfortunately, um, a lot of it can be true because of the national defunding of public housing. But just to put this in perspective, so NYCHA announces $10 million of new funding to give people internet access. This is a bad story. Why is it a bad thing? The newspapers find 10,000 reasons why $10 million is bad to bring internet. So this is the, the type of context that they're working in every day. Exactly. <laughs> I didn't say it. <laughs> um, so one, I think one of the things that we've seen in terms of pro bono resources is um, the, in, the difference in risk appetite. So when we were doing these uh, community visioning sessions that helped inform a lot of Next Generation NYCHA and the project with Alexander, in that case, we had uh, a philanthropic organization that was ready to make a direct financial investment at, at a very early stage when the outcomes were very unknown. And that was one form of very important support. But bringing in Alexander's group was crucial in terms of the income use of the, um, the expertise of these um, c consultants. For example, there is a retail broker who essentially is taking a risk reputationally to reach out to a big retailer and say, hey, I know you have this new concept, like this new smaller format concept. Do you think we could look into an arrangement at multiple NYCHA developments, you know, and try something completely new and unheard of? Now, of course, you know, he might benefit from it, but the reality is it's also a risk that he's doing by putting his time into it, traveling several hours to these meetings, as well as his reputational risk. And so we need that both because, we, again, we don't have the expertise, but imagine the articles if, if it said that we were spending money on looking at things like this. So essentially, you're saying that there is no R&D function in the right. public sector. Uh, you can't afford to risk the money, even though the payoff is potentially huge, but it's innovative, it's different, no one's done it before, so it might not pay off at all. And so there, where do you get who is going to bear that risk? The public will, will benefit from it, but what about the downside? And I think I've heard similarly from you, Stephen, the, the way that you're trying to balance the risks of these innovative ideas yeah, with, no, with private ab partners. Absolutely. Even in trying to just put the ideas together, we, uh, you know, we're looking at a population, we refer to them as undocumented immigrants. The tabloid papers in New York would refer to them as illegal aliens. And if anyone, if, if the paper starts to get whiffed that New York City is looking to spend city taxpayer dollars to help illegal aliens, there's going, there are going to be editorials, there are going to be a, a groundswell against what we're trying to do. So to be able to use pro bono services to help develop the ideas and, and before presenting it to the public at large, which, which we've done already, we presented it um, in a way that's saying, look, these are your residents, these are your neighbors, we're doing the right thing. But to get us to that point by only through the use of pro bono services is, uh, is tremendously helpful and, and potentially may not have been possible, frankly. Right. And it, it's also sometimes we see in any large organization, public or private, is you've got these silos, right? There's one very large global consultancy that I love to work with. And anytime I'm in a meeting with them, there are always three of them. They can never be just one. And inevitably, the three have just met for the first time. Right? And sometimes with city government, it's the same way. I mean, you guys have more workers than most cities in the country have residents. Uh, but sometimes it's that, that external impetus that enables you to work across, across these silos. And it, it seems like such a natural fit between the public hospitals and the public housing 
to, to work together closely. Like hundreds of thousands of Medicare patients are public housing residents. So what is the challenge of actually serving that population in a unified way? And how can you leverage some of the external expertise to, to get to that? I, th I, I think the biggest challenge is, so it's, it's interesting that the two people you have on the stage from New York City government are dealing with two uh, quasi-government agencies, if you will. The, the only two that I can think of that we actually charge the people that we're trying to serve, or at least we try to charge the people that we're trying to serve. The fire department doesn't issue a bill. The, the police department doesn't issue a bill. The uh, Department of Education doesn't issue a bill if you're using public education. But uh, our public hospitals do their best to try and re get reimbursement through their uh, patients, NYCHA charges residents for housing. Um, but of course, it's done in, in an inefficient manner because you're not charging a fair market value for your housing. And we're certainly dealing with, at the hospital system, a lot of individuals who are uninsured um, for whom we don't actually pursue payment of their services. Um, but at the same time, we're technically corporations, or in your case, an authority. And the charge from the city and, and to the outside world is, well, you're a hospital system. You're supposed to, if not make money, at least break even. Um, and but like in the private sector, we look yeah. at cross-marketing right. as a way that's a financial benefit. But it sounds like what you're saying is sometimes those financial pressures are actually an impediment. Right. So the, so the financial pressures that you're dealing with, they're, they, they come in at a quarterly basis, on, on a quarterly basis, sometimes even less. We do monthly board meetings where the financials are reported. You have press in the room every time. As soon as they're reported, they're going to the press the very next day. Um, and the pressure is just overwhelming. What are we going to do next quarter? What are we going to do next quarter? Um, and when you're constantly dealing with a structural deficit, the idea of trying to be forward thinking and thinking long term, well, let's, let's set up something with a New York City Housing Authority where perhaps it'll be beneficial for the corporation, um, it becomes more difficult to do. And I think that's really where you need the, the individual or individuals that can cross those sectors, like at City Hall, to bring those uh, agencies together and those staffers together. But, but also, Karina, you're, you're looking for paying tenants in these ground floor spaces. Mm -hmm. Doctors, hospitals, they pay bills. Why isn't it just a slam dunk to bring the public hospitals in and serve your residents more effectively there? Well, I think the good news is that you and I are both looking at this right <laughs> now. Um, but, you know, one, there's, there's a history of sort of NYCHA is a land bank. Um, so let's just put it there, um, you know, the city kind of for any use. So I think it's us as an organization trying to be more strategic about the use of those spaces. So we want to look at this and we want to understand this, but will it meet the various metrics that we have, which is either resident services, revenue generation, ground floor activation, and not just, well, we own a lot of land, let's just put it in there. We own a lot of buildings. Um, but additionally, one of things that we're also um, dealing with, even, even for things that might be about building out a little bit of a ground floor space or changing the configuration of a campus, is the constant threat and fear of demolition of public housing, which is an image that you know from across the country, Pruitt I go in Chicago, Cabrini Green in St. Louis, I'm sorry, flipped, um, <laughs> I flipped those two, but uh, you know, so anything, any change, there is a threat of demolition. And so that's something we're also fighting against, too. Okay, so I'm going to ask these guys one last question. It's going to be real hard. It's going to take a while to think about it. It's a stumper. And then after that, I'm going to open it to all of you. So think about your questions. There are microphones around the room, so you can ask. So uh, in honor of Back to the Future Day, 30 years ago, cities were on the verge of dying out. Right, uh, everyone was leaving them. Incidentally, 30 years ago in Chicago is when this model of strategic pro bono partnership with City Hall developed. And 30 years later, we now have this model in New York where we work. Uh, in San Jose, there's a Silicon Valley talent partnership. Uh, in New Orleans, in Minnesota, uh, Los Angeles, most recently here in, in San Francisco with Civic Bridge. So it's really getting to be this national model building on one this trend that cities are tackling challenges that they need talent that doesn't typically reside in city hall and two interestingly enough companies are looking for ways to motivate and develop their workers and they find that pro bono service is one of the most cost effective hr strategies you can pursue so that's why we're seeing this come up really uh really growing the last few years but now let's jump 30 years in the future so it's uh, 30 years ahead. What is it, what, what, what does the world look like 
where you're where you're working now in 30 in years. In the public the hospital system? Yeah. Uh, we're going to have more space at NYCHA housing for some <laughs> clinics. <laughs> Somehow that has to do with my future. Um, you know, I think 30 years is tough. Maybe I can imagine 10 to 15, right? I don't, I don't see any flying cars or hoverboards right now. So um, as we know, maybe we can't predict 30 years in the future that well. But, um, you know, my ba next generation NYCHA is a lot about changing the way NYCHA looks and how it rebuilds itself. And uh, my background is in public-private partnerships and real estate. So I can see myself going on a walk through downtown Brooklyn through one of our what we call scattered site developments. It's a tenement sort of walk-up building. It doesn't look like most of that traditional tower in the park stuff. And that's been completely rehabilitated. Um, it is now managed by a private manager um, that's owned by a public-private partnership and is a Section 8 um, development, and that has enabled it to get money, and the residents who initially were totally fearful of this change now love it. And the and good the, news is that's your 10-year goal as part of the that's plan. That's right? But then I keep walking, <laughs> and, and another site, another campus that had five available development sites, we've completely reimagined. Mixed income, mixed use, um, and that would be revolutionary. That's, you know, that's right next to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And then there's another site where we're putting up a new affordable housing building, and um, that would allow seniors to move out of public housing into the new unit, thereby freeing up these large units that they live in, that they've lived in for many years, so we can get more people into public housing. We have some new retail spaces. We've added on Myrtle Avenue, single story, glass front. Maybe there's a resident-owned cooperative in there. So the good news is, for the next 30 years, Brooklyn is the future. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, we're gonna to open to questions. When we were taking this model from Chicago to New York, there's one person who said, I love what you guys are doing in Chicago. I wanna see it in New York City, and I'm gonna figure out how to make that happen. And he stood up to ask us our first question. So, Mac, please. Well, thanks, Alex. So, um, uh, and now I wanna stump you, because uh, when we talked about bringing a Civic Consulting Alliance at the time from Chicago to New York, um, I was actually had a, um, a different agenda. I wanted to find a way to bring it to Detroit. And remember, one of the, the challenges we had was, and you know, the premise of this panel, as a matter of fact, is how do we bring resources and skills to under-resourced places? And certainly, New York and San Francisco and Chicago and Minneapolis, St. Paul aren't really under-resourced when you get down to it. And uh, one of the challenges that, that you identified was we had to find local pools of talent that we could draw from to help to answer the local problem. So we had to go to a place, if we wanted to bring consultants, we had to go to a place that had consulting practices with benches of people who we could then bring in to answer some of the city's problems, right? And certainly there's a deep bench of people in New York who are working for consulting firms, a lot of them sitting around waiting for the next job to come along. But so what's the answer yet? Or have you figured out the answer to franchise this to get it to Detroit or to get it to Utica or to get it to the really under-resourced places that actually need to build real capacity in local government and could really use the help from pro bono consulting? And not just consulting, other kinds of skill sets as well. So it's a great question. Let me take a stab at it and love to hear what you guys think. It's off the top, looking at Detroit, uh, as well as other cities, that what we've done in Chicago is a, is a lot of professional service firms, because Chicago is the professional service capital of the Midwest. In, in San Jose, it's a lot of tech companies, because that's what's there. Uh, in New Orleans, we're looking at energy. Uh, we're looking at some smaller entrepreneurial companies to participate. Uh, we're also finding in New Orleans that it's smaller. So that means you need less investment to start to see the type of change we're looking at. So whereas with, with NYCHA or the public hospitals in New York, multi-billion dollar organizations, and it takes millions of investment over time just in the change catalyzation, in uh, New Orleans, we're seeing systemic projects come from hundreds of thousands of dollars of effort, which is something that actually is achievable out of the local community there. I'm curious, what are your so thoughts? I, I'm, my thought would be, so I'm gonna be the typical New Yorker and be a little arrogant and say cities like New York, San Francisco, all see themselves as incubators of democracy. Um, and I think that there's an idea that if you, can, if you have a great idea and you can sort of uh, incubate it, if you will, in a city like San Francisco, in a city like New 
New York, in a city like Chicago, uh, you could take the ideas and you could work some of the uh, more difficult um, analyses, if you will, in, in the larger cities, and, and you could sort of export those ideas to a place like Detroit, just as a thought. Um, a secondary thought I would just add is, even in a city like New York, it's, it's true, it has more money than a place like Detroit, but it has money to implement a program, but not necessarily the money or the willingness to uh, spend money to test out a program or to develop a program. So if you could spend the money to develop a program via pro bono services, then the city of New York has the money to, to let it go. And then that's the, the idea would be perhaps that you could spread that to other cities like Detroit. So being at the bleeding edge is costlier than being a fast follower. Right. There's a way of tack, uh, implementing the ideas uh, more efficiently. Let's, uh, over here on uh, Thank question. You. Thank you so much. My name is Derek. I'm a lecturer at Stanford University. I wanted to bring a, a slightly academic perspective to this discussion. Um, I'm working with a lot of students uh, more and more recently that uh, from Stanford who don't want to go into the tech scene or go into big corporations, but want to work on civic issues and, and real world problems even during their education. So we're trying to develop project-based learning experiences where a team of interdisciplinary students can work with a uh, a city municipality or, or stakeholders in a city uh, to do what I suspect is very similar type of essentially quote unquote pro bono work for, for cities. Um, and you know, we're working with a lot of local uh, cities, you know, to the last question, city of San Jose right now. Uh, and we did try to reach out to, to the, at least the NYC EDC, the Economic Development Corporation. But I was surprised to find that there was no structured way in which cities were tapping into academic or especially local academic uh, student pro bono work because um, they really want to work on these issues. So I'm just wondering if in the future you guys see an opportunity to think of pro bono as not just uh, consulting like this, but, but academia as well. Absolutely. Uh, actually, so, uh, since oh. we're running over, we're going to bring one more question up. We okay. won't have a chance to answer them, but you can hear we're burgeoning with answers. So let's continue to talk over the break. So Carla, please. Yeah. Hi, my name is Carla Mays. I run a consulting firm here in San Francisco, May Civic Innovation. My question is, these cities that you've mentioned have huge problems with gentrification. We seem to be, you know, these, these public-private partnerships, they're building for everyone but the folks in. And how do, how do we start to see a more ground-up approach where we're, you know, re, re reinventing these cities where the folks are, that are there are actually benefiting? that they are the entrepreneur, they are the, you know, the, the small business owner, and that, the, you know, that we're looking at models where, they're more grand, where they are more rooted um, in community. Because, you know, I live in San Francisco from Los Angeles. You know, none of these cities are doing a great job at really building for those folks that are there. And our gentrification problems are getting worse as our cities are getting smarter. So on that cliffhanger, let's thank the panel. What? Uh -huh. Please. Thanks. Uh, Betsy Morris, um, consultant, uh, thinker, writer, um, planning for sustainable communities and co-housing California. So my question dovetails a little bit, but it picks up on maybe the next 10 years. Uh, the best knowledge I know about innovations in what's called pooled uh, commons pooled resource commons, in other words, this vast tract of publicly owned housing and the land around it, is that the decisions, long-term sustainability is that the decisions are made closest to the people who are actually affected by the decisions. Um, so I'm curious about participatory methods and fully, more fully engaging the residents, hopefully as trust is built, in future decision making collectively about the use of this, these common pool public resources. So uh, participatory budgeting, which has been sort of endorsed by HUD for CDBG, uh, uh, open books management, which is used in employee stock ownership, things that bring both transparency and truly empowered decision making from the bottom up. Do you see any future in that in the work you're doing? Thanks. Well, I love this method of Q, no Q&A, just Q. <laughs> it makes our job much easier. Well, so thank you very much, panel. Thank you. <laughs> Th thanks to our panel. We're